So let me start with very quick bio. Uh, there's only two things that I just wanted to plant in your head before I kind of go into my presentation is, I started in the industry, so I'm a chemical engineer. Okay, that was my background. And I worked at Lindell Bazell for about six years, process engineering, but optimization. And I quickly saw that when I was running linear program models for the entire site, determining what is optimal, it was starting to get very complex and the organization couldn't keep up with the change, okay? So then I joined Immubit in 2019. I started as the engineer that actually develops the reinforcement learning models. So no, I have no AI or data science background, but I was able to develop these models, okay? So let's kind of jump into the problem. So I'll start on the refining side, but we see it across a lot of continuous industrial processes, which is kind of what I alluded to, which is the optimization problem has become exponentially more complex, right? So I call it 20 years ago, a lot of plant managers had the KPI of just pushing throughput, right? If you push max production in the plant, you're good. That doesn't really fly anymore, okay? So what's happened is as markets become competitive, right, especially in the refining space, you start to go after opportunistic crudes, cause a lot of change in the plant. You don't have a clear understanding or data around why that change is happening, but the plant starts changing a lot more, right? Then it, there's the level above, which is now we have sustainability as a key factor, right? So you can't just push the plant to max and run really inefficient because that's gonna start hurting your bottom line, right? And then there's a lot of volatility in the market as well. So prices are moving around as the market gets more competitive. When prices change, that means you have to make different products, right? So not only do we see this in refining, but we see it in other industries too. So like the mining industry, for example, is really key for the energy transition, right? And you see the same thing impacting the bottom line. In the mining industry, you know, demand has gone way past supply right now for metals like copper, or lithium. So now, if you're not maximizing production, the cost of leaving the three to 5% that you have capacity in your plant has now become really expensive, okay? But if you don't capture that three to 5% by lowering your emissions, by running less energy, right? That now is adding to the opportunity cost on the table and then someone mentioned it on one of the panel sessions today, which is there's a huge experience void, right? In the past, a lot of the optimization was done in people's heads, right? People who ran the plant for decades who had a feel. That experience is out the door now, right? So now you can't even get back to the baseline that you had before. So this cost of not optimizing this complex problem is just continuing to grow, okay? So let me start with just a little quick case study and I'll try to make it in a way that you don't even have to understand refining, but basically what you see here is a, a plot of profitability on the x-axis, you can just call it profit, and on the y-axis is hydrogen, and this is for a refinery unit called a hydrocracker, okay? And it's as simple as this. What a hydrocracker does, it takes low value components of a crude barrel, temperature, hydrogen catalyst, and then you're trying to crack it to make high value components, okay? So call it 30 years ago, right? And I mentioned that story of a plant manager, his KPI, his bonus was based on pushing throughput, right? And back then, hydrogen was so, valued so less relative to the incremental throughput that when you plot the profit function, it's pretty flat with hydrogen. So what that means is the plant manager didn't care about how much hydrogen he was using. He just said, push it to the max and then let's start moving up the feed so I can hit my KPI, right? But that's changed significantly today, specifically in regions where sustainability is kicked in, like in Europe. Now hydrogen has a pretty significant price. And it's priced at the cost of the CO2 emissions it takes to create that hydrogen, like in a steam methane reformer. So now when you plug the new hydrogen cost back into the optimization function, now there's actually a trade-off. If I push more rate and I need to use more hydrogen, it's actually not worth it anymore. So if you don't recognize that, you might actually be optimizing your plant to a suboptimal state, okay? So look, now the problem is a lot more evident. Optimization is more complex, but there's some challenges in overcoming this and actually solving the plant optimization problem in its true complex nature, right? And there's two things that I kind of boil it down to, which is there's a technology challenge. The technologies that we've been using for decades hadn't had to solve this problem in its full complex nature and it's not really capable of doing it. But if we do find a technology that can solve this problem, we get the reward of optimizing to the plant's bottom line minute by minute as it continues to change, okay? 
The second challenge is a people challenge. And this everyone in the room is familiar with. Any technology you bring, there's a bunch of change management, right? There's no doubt about it. But what's happened is, you know, us as good engineers, you know, when we see a complex problem, we simplify it, right? If we do that today with this problem, we will leave that value on the table. So the change management piece here is, how do we get the people at the plant, the engineers optimizing these processes, to now truly see the complex problem and not simplify it and then work together to solve it, okay? So let me start with the technology challenge. So I alluded to it. There's really three things that make processes very complex today, which is the changing nature, which we call process dynamics. The relationships between two variables are not consistent anymore. And when you simplify it using kind of the tradi traditional methods we did with linear models or first principles, we're basically trying to limit the amount of change in these process variables, process dynamics when we're modeling. The second piece is unmeasured disturbances. So I talked about the example of you know, refiners buying more opportunistic crudes and not knowing the components in that crude. That's something that there's no data. It's really hard to bring that data, especially when you're talking about changing the plant minute by minute. That data is really hard to get. So we call it unmeasured disturbances. And then there's interdependency, which is the decisions around making control and optimization decisions, you might have multiple handles that help you achieve the same objective, but the costs associated with moving those handles are changing, right? So the decision that you need to make on one day might require you to make another decision on another day to get back to optimal. So we call that interdependency. So you can see there I've outlined the drawbacks with process dynamics when we use linear or first principle models to model reality, which is often this highly nonlinear blue line, you can see the natural error there, right? In today's world, when we're trying to get this minute by minute optimization of this complex problem, because the cost is so high of not solving it, we can't afford this level of error, okay? The second piece is with unmeasured disturbances, there's going to be an endless amount of variables in the world to measure and that's kind of what we needed as classical engineers. You need to specify every input into a model. But what, to solve this problem today, we can't afford to wait you know, years to get all the technology to measure everything that is not measured today, okay? And then in terms of interdependency, that graphic right there is a three-dimensional solution space. You can imagine optimizing a plant is gonna be way more complex, right? And basically in a three-dimensional solution space, you can see that there's little peaks and valleys, but there's one that's that red peak, which is the true optimal. When you look at the plant in its true reality constantly changing, not only do those peaks change, but the location of the red peak is also moving. So when you make the same decisions every day, you're probably not gonna drive to the red peak, which is the true optimal, and you're not always gonna find the true optimal in the plant, okay? So then it begs to ask yourself, you know, what do you actually need to solve this problem? And it's pretty straightforward, but getting there is challenging, right? So process dynamics don't make simplifications to the plant. Model the true reality of the plant and its complex nonlinear nature. For unmeasured disturbances, don't go down the journey of trying to measure everything that is not measured. Use what data you have today to extract the information that tells you things about the plant changing because of unmeasured disturbances. And then for interdependency, don't simplify your strategy for optimization to a few decisions. You know, push throughput every day. Actually master the true solution space and learn to change your decisions to always find where that red peak is, the true optimal, as the plant changes too, okay? So this is what Nadav talked about today, which is what we came up with to solve the requirements, to meet the requirements, is our approach here, and I won't talk too much about it, but I'll just briefly go through this. What we do to model the reality of the plant is we first create a deep learning neural network trained on years of plant historical data, learning all the changes in the plant without simplifying. No linear models, no first principle theory, but learning all the different states in the plant as those relationships change, right? So you can imagine when the plant is brand new, you move throughput one, you see a certain response, but as the plant degrades over time and starts to get dirty or fouled, you get a different response. And basically what you're doing is just categorizing all these different relationships. And if you can effectively do so, what you have is a dynamic simulation of the plant, a virtual version of the plant on the cloud. 
Then you train another model that can actually learn the process relationship, but also make decisions to master the solution space. And that's the reinforcement learning model. Another neural network trained through reinforcement learning, trial and erroring on the virtual plant, hundreds of millions of times, learning right from wrong, all in the cloud, in the safe environment. And once experts, people who understand the plant, validate both the simulator and the controller, then you bring the controller on site for direct control and optimization of the plant. And it does it without simplifying this complex optimization function, okay? So kind of tying it back to an application, this one's actually not in a refinery, but it's really kind of simple to understand, but it truly was a complex optimization problem. This is a rotary kiln. So in the pet coke industry, you take petroleum coke that's unrefined, you put it through a rotary kiln, it boils off volatiles and other materials, so at the outlet you get refined petroleum coke, and it's like a higher grade fuel that goes into like the alumina industry and the cement industry. So this producer really had the challenging time understanding the dynamics in the kiln. Why? Because a lot of things are not measured. What you might do in a theoretical model doesn't match what's in the plant because the kiln is naturally changing over time. The feed quality changes, the quality of the coke coming in, it's not consistently measured. And you have a lot of handles that you can use to change the dynamics in the kiln. So for a human, it's quite a non-intuitive problem. Right? So basically what we do, and I'll walk you through how we developed this model, and it's pretty straightforward in terms of the definition you provide for the AI, right? So you start with what is truly the plant's bottom line objective? And in this case, it was to maximize the production, the yield of the product, so make as much refined pet coke as you can at the lowest energy cost, right? So that was the objective we defined for the model. Then we said, great, what handles can you use to achieve that objective? And they said, okay, we can put air at different points in the kiln, natural gas is our main fuel source, and then you can change the rotation of the rotary kiln, which changes the residence time. We said, great. And then what are you trying to achieve outside of the economic objective? Okay, so we have some operating limits we have to respect, like the temperature of the kiln. If you go too hot, you damage the kiln's refractory. And then we also have a product spec, which is the density. You have to hit a minimum density. So that right there, only a process expert can give you, right? Not a data scientist. But that set the definition for the reinforcement learning model to now solve, okay? So looking at the time series there, because everything we do when the models come on site, it directly controls the plant, okay? So you can see on the yellow, the side that's not yellow shaded is the operator running their plant just with basic controls. And you can see for the temperature on the top plot, you know, in a control sense, you're pretty happy if you're staying within limits, right? So you can see there's a lot of variable in the, in the temperature. Towards the end, they violate the upper limit, but overall, they're within their bounds. Right? And on the bottom there is their density, okay? So when they go above on the density, it's okay, but what's happening is they're actually burning the coke in the kiln, so they're losing product. If you go below, it's not saleable product anymore, so you're not meeting your minimum spec. Okay, and you can see there has some challenges around maintaining that density. But then you can see when our model turns on, it's solving for the bottom line optimal that we defined, which was maximize production, reduce the energy cost, right? That's what it's focused on solving. And you can see what happens in this scenario, it's actually finding an optimal on the burn zone temperature, not just content with staying between the upper and lower bound, but finding the right exact point to maximize its economic objective. And it found an optimal by reducing the burn zone temperature about 200 degrees and that was the right move to get it right on top of that density without going above, which is burning the product, and reducing the natural gas significantly, okay? And if you were to look at this model today with a different set of conditions, it would have found a different answer, but all together achieving this economic objective that a process expert defined for it, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna quickly go through the second part because the first part was talking about how you can actually prove the solution, find a problem for it, prove it out. But now it becomes about scale, right? And I alluded to it, which is organizations today basically have different functions. They broke down this complex problem into pieces, and they all look at the plant in a different scope, okay? And this is the fundamental problem, because now we're asking them, there's actually one plant, one optimization problem. 
you all should be focused on the same exact reality of the plant, okay? And this is what we developed with our solution, which is folks like me, who don't come from a data science or AI background, can now develop these models, okay? And what this enables is all the other experts in the plant can now all look at the same reality of the plant optimization problem. And Nadav kind of talked to this in his lecture, which is we use explainability in AutoML, explainability to kind of show you what the models learn in terms of what you understand as an expert, not in the data science way, and AutoML where we automate all the data science aspects, and now all the definition needs is the process definition that I defined, okay? And obviously the domain expertise here cannot be automated. So basically there's a lot of questions that an expert would ask, and what we've done is we've developed applications like this that allow you just with your process knowledge to quickly play around with the model, not type in any code, not interact with it in any type of special AI way, but purely from your process knowledge, and start asking the model, hey, if I were to change a constraint, how would it change your behavior? And this is how you can start building confidence in the model based on your first principles understanding. And then the same thing, like I explained before, rather than having an expert define the number of layers, nodes, you know, activation function, we basically introduce an AutoML algorithm, is a way to think about it, that takes the inputs that you can't automate, which is the definition of the process, and then you can train your deep learning controller on the back end. Okay, okay I'll stop there and then uh, see if there's time for one or two questions. Do you have any questions? questions? Going. I bore him to death. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you talked about like twenty percent population. Have you looked at things like that to take that question? Uh we haven't. We're kind of focused on you know building credibility and in continuous industrial processes. We look at a lot of time series data and then making change to a continuously changing problem. So that's kind of where we're focused, but I guess the application could probably extend to, Spaces like you're talking about around like transportation optimization, things like that. Thanks. Yeah. Hello, uh, Ben from Intel. Uh, just wanted to ask for the, I don't know if you, you, you know about what the, the background on it is, but the, just curious with the neural network that you used, like did you explore if that was better versus like a traditional like XG boost type model. Um, I was just curious on more of the, the back end of the neural network. Why use the, the deep learning here? That's probably a question for Nadav more than this for me. I don't know if you want to add to that enough. Uh, yeah, so I could just say that, uh, yes, we did run these comparisons in the early days, and it's a huge difference uh, with these quantities of data that we're talking about, Then it's similar to other domains where neural networks are far superior to other approaches that uh, at least I'm aware of. And that includes XGBoost and, thing, and additional things. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Everybody join me in thank thanking Javi. Thank you, guys. Javi.